Okay, here we go. Um, now, I was in Cub Scouts once, used to do this. Sign of the Wolf, right? Okay. Quiet Coyote. What? Quiet Coyote. Yeah, Quiet Coyote. There you go. Um, uh, I was going to record the lectures. I have. A, I bought a video camera just to do that. That's what my little pink lunch box is for here. I got a, There's a video camera in here. And I'm going to have one of you videotape the lectures and then put them online for all of us, uh, if you'd like. Um, I'm going to do this one here on my computer. Uh, it'll just have PowerPoint and my voice and your voices, too. And you won't get to be in any of the pictures. I'm sorry. All right. <clears throat> so today we're going to talk about the respiratory system. And I always figure if we're going to talk about the respiratory system, it would be really nice. Maybe you could kill some of the lights back there. Uh, it would be really nice if we could start with uh, one more. That's good. That's good enough. It would be nice if we could start with an x-ray. Okay. Now, don't shout out a bunch of stuff, but tell me one thing that you see on that x-ray. One thing. Have you ever seen an x-ray like that before? What is, what is it? Name one thing you see in there. The ribs. Very good. All right. Yeah, these are the ribs. Okay, one other thing. The clavicles. Ah, yes. These are the clavicles up there. Very good. Anything else? Yes, sir. Vertebrae. Yeah, you can see the vertebrae. And by the way, for those of you who are going to go into x-ray one of these years, this is a really good exposure. You want to just barely be able to make out the vertebrae through the heart and through the, through the body on a plain chest x-ray. You're really not shooting for vertebrae. You're really shooting for lungs and hearts and things. Yeah. Scapulas? Yeah, the scapulas are way out to the side. How many of you have ever had a chest x-ray made? You know, you put your, you put your uh, chin on this thing, and then they say, roll your shoulders forward and touch the film and take a deep breath, and it's kind of a weird position. But the reason we do that is to roll those scapulas out of the way, because if you were just standing there normally, the scapula would be right there and you wouldn't be able to see that part of the lung near as well with the scapula over there. So yeah. Yes, sir. You see the car, uh, the heart. Yeah, okay. Yeah, this is the heart right here. Anything else? Yes? Is the shutter stop below the stomach? This here? Yep. Yeah, well, that's a bubble in the stomach. That's air in the stomach. You might refer to that as a impending belch. Yes. You see the diaphragms. Very good. These are the two diaphragms. Yes, ma'am. I see that. Yeah, I was going to try to embarrass some guy. Yeah, is it a male or female? It's a female. Um, I noticed, I know most of you weren't looking for things like that, but. A lot of the guys tend to. That's a female. <laughs> what is uh, what is this thing up here? What? Signature. Yeah, that's really what it is. First of all, it's got an L, which means left. So that's truly the patient's left side. You're looking at the patient from the front always when you're looking at x-rays. You're looking at the patient from the front. That's their left side. You notice that under that it has a K8. Well, K8 is the code for the x-ray tech that took that picture. Okay? So if the picture picture is not right, if there's some big problem with it, they know who to go back to and say, you know what, you didn't really do a very good job on that one. Get, drag that patient back down here again and take another film. Okay? And the other thing, this last thing below that is this is what's called an air fluid level. You see there's a little, it's a round thing, but it's got some liquid in it, and the liquid goes to the lowest part, and the reason is, is because that film is taken with the patient sitting up. It's an upright film. Okay. What's
what's in the lungs? The lungs aren't just uniform. What, what is all of this stuff out here in the lungs? What? Capillaries. Well, capillaries, <laughs> but bigger than that, too. There's, there's arteries and veins. There's blood. Pulmonary arteries carry blood to the lungs, get it oxygenated. Veins bring it back. Intercostal muscles. Yeah, but you know, I don't think I've ever seen a problem with an intercostal muscle, so they don't really show up. They're dark. Um, they would obviously go right in here between these things, but not much to see there. Bronchi, that's right. In addition to the blood vessels that are carrying blood to the lungs and back from the lungs, there's also breathing tubes, bronchioles, bronchial tubes that are bringing blood, uh, being, bringing air to the alveoli and then breathing it back out. Wow. You had better play. Whether you're racing in a triathlon or doing something less strenuous, you need to breathe in oxygen to help you get energy and breathe out carbon dioxide, a waste product. Notice the oxygens are two reds, the carbon dioxide are one black, which is carbon. When you inhale, oxygens. your diaphragm and rib muscles contract, increasing the volume of your lungs. When you exhale, these muscles relax, decreasing the volume of the lungs. When the lungs expand, air pressure in the lungs drops, causing air to flow into the lungs. When lung volume decreases, air pressure increases, causing air to flow out of the lungs. Air enters the nose or mouth, moves down the trachea, and goes into the two bronchi. Air moves down smaller and smaller bronchioles until it reaches a tiny sac, an alveolus. Each alveolus is surrounded by capillaries. Oxygen diffuses from the alveolus to the blood and carbon dioxide diffuses from the blood to the alveolus. As blood flows through the capillary, it becomes rich in oxygen. In the blood, oxygen diffuses into a red blood cell and binds to hemoglobin, a protein made up of four subunits. One oxygen molecule can bind to each subunit. Oxygen-rich blood flows from the lungs to the heart. Which pumps this blood to capillaries all over the body. Here, we see oxygen diffusing from a capillary's red blood cells into a muscle cell. Oxygen is used by the cell's mitochondria to produce ATP during cellular respiration. Carbon dioxide is released. How does carbon dioxide leave the body? Carbon dioxide diffuses from cells into capillaries. Some carbon dioxide stays in the plasma, the liquid part of the blood. Most carbon dioxide, however, enters red blood cells. Some carbon dioxide binds to hemoglobin. The rest is converted to bicarbonate, which diffuses into the plasma. This oxygen-poor blood flows back to the heart, which pumps it to the lungs. There, Carbon dioxide diffuses from the plasma into the alveolus. 
Bicarbonate enters red blood cells and is converted back to carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is also released from hemoglobin. Carbon dioxide diffuses out of the red blood cells, into the plasma, and into the alveolus. When you exhale, air flows out of your lungs. And that's how you release carbon dioxide, get oxygen, and keep on running. Now, I know that most of you didn't get all of that. That was a lot of stuff in three minutes. Um, we're going to spend the next three days probably going through all of that step by step by step and make that understandable. But just so you know, when, you've been, when, you, when we've been through all of that, you should be able to come back and watch that video again, which you have access to, and you should understand every single bit of it, okay? Because that's what you need to understand to really understand how this breathing thing works and how this respiratory system works, okay? What are the five functions of the respiratory system? Well, they're pretty easy. Number one, it provides an extensive gas exchange surface area between the air and the circulating blood. They say in your book, I believe, that the average surface area of the inside of the alveoli is the size of two tennis courts, if you can lay it all out. Two tennis courts, that's how much surface there is compacted into this little area called your lungs that enables you to exchange the gases in both directions. So that's one of the major functions of the respiratory system. Another part of the respiratory system, its job is to move the air in and to move the air out. We have a series of muscles uh, and tubes that enable us to do that. Uh, it protects our respiratory surfaces from the outside environment. Now, I used to go running a lot. I used to run a lot. And I would oftentimes run when it was really cold outside. And you would think if you ran when it was cold outside, you would just freeze the inner linings of your breathing tubes because you're sucking in this air that's 20 degrees. Your body is 98.6. And surely it's going to just freeze the inner side, inner, inside of things. But it doesn't. Why not? Does that kind of humidifying thing? Yeah, it does that kind of humidifying thing. Where does it do that kind of humidifying thing? It terminates. Remember the, the what do you call those big conky things that hang off of both sides of your nose? And, you know, it's all moist up in there and uh, it warms them up. They also tend to stir the air around, and so it doesn't just go straight back. It gets it gets mixed up. It gets warmed, it gets humidified before it gets down to your lungs. It also pulls out all the garbage. Now, you can't pull out all the garbage if you're smoking cigarettes and, pure, and sucking that crap right into your mouth and into your lungs. But most of us, in, they're breathing clean air. We can filter out most everything that's in the air. Um, you guys have all experienced, you know, when you're in a dusty environment, a lot of times you'll, you'll have really dirty looking snot because all of that, all of that air as it goes through your nose, it grabs onto those mucous membranes, those sides, and then gradually gets kind of washed out of there. I'll, I'll give you, I'll tell you how I really feel about smoking later. I could not talk and make sounds if I didn't have a respiratory system. The reason I can talk is because I suck air in and I blow air out and as it comes out it goes past my vocal cords and I can control my vocal cords. I can talk really low or I can talk really high because I can change the tension on my vocal cords. I'm going to show you some videos of that. And last thing, if I didn't have a respiratory system I couldn't smell, right? That's the olfactory sense. Smelling, and we we smell because our olfactory uh, mucosa is all up above that top conky, at the very top of our nose. All right, there you got them. Those are easy, right? All right. Um, you'll probably 
hear me say several times in AMP that there's such, such a thing as lumpers and there's such a thing as splitters. And as we, as people have written anatomy books and physiology books through the years, some guys are lumpers and they kind of throw things into one category. And there are guys who are splitters that have to split it up into 17 different ones. Well, this is kind of one of those things. The respiratory system is divided into the upper respiratory system above the larynx and the lower respiratory system, and that's below the larynx. The larynx is your voice box. It's your Adam's apple. Okay? Everybody feel it. Feel your larynx. Okay? So that's what divides the respiratory system into the upper and lower. Now, that's really not very functional. Um, this one is a better functional division of the two parts of the respiratory system. A conducting portion, that's just tubes. That's just carrying the air down into your lungs. Okay? That's all they do. They just conduct the air. They don't make any changes in it. They don't absorb anything out of it. They don't, they don't put anything into it, really, except a little water as it goes through your nose. And then there's the respiratory portion. This is where the action is. This is where all of the, the stuff that keeps you alive happens. This is where you absorb the oxygen. This is where you excrete the carbon dioxide so that you can actually live by, by bringing in the good gas, <laughs> oxygen, blowing out the bad gas, carbon dioxide. Okay? So the respiratory portion is only the very last, the tiniest little tubes there are called the respiratory bronchioles. And the reason they're called respiratory bronchioles is because they're not even tubes. They're tubes that have lots and lots of alveoli coming right off of them. And then the alveoli, which are nothing but alveoli at the end. I'll show you examples of that, and we'll see them under the microscope. <coughs> Alveoli are the air-filled air pockets within the lungs. This is where all the gas exchange is going to take place, uh, and that's really where the action happens, as I've talked to you about. And here's a nice little picture, uh, as usual. They have great pictures. Uh, they, here's the upper respiratory system and lower respiratory system, as in, i.e., above the larynx and below the larynx. Okay. Right lung, left lung, ribs, bronchioles, bronchus, trachea. The trachea is the one main tube that carries air down from your pharynx, back of your mouth. Uh, let's talk, start up here at the top. Here's the nasal conchi, uh, superior, middle, and inferior, in from your nose. Question. What's this bone right here? Huh? Sphenoid bone? Ethmoid bone? Huh? What's this bone right here? Makes up the top of your mouth. Hard pile, all about. It's called the palate, yeah. What bone is it? Maxillary bone, that's right. If you're going into dentistry, why do you need to know that's the maxilla? Because all the upper teeth plug into the maxilla, maxillary bone, okay? That's the upper one. What's the lower one called? Mandible. Yeah. So this is the mandible down here. All right. Three things you ought to know. Uh, you ought to know about the pharynx. The pharynx is the, uh, the joint cavity that's in the back, also oftentimes referred to as your throat. And basically, it has three parts. It has the uh, nasopharynx, which is the nasal part of it. The oropharynx goes from here to here. And then the laryngopharynx, which is right below that. So three parts to the pharynx. The pharynx carries both food and it carries air. Okay? And you know that when you get excited or sick or cough or something, you can, you know everything connects back there because you've all snorted milk out your nose, right, and you've all choked on things that you've tried to eat because they went down the wrong way and started to go down into your trachea. Hyoid bone, remember that one? It's kind of way up in there. You can't really feel it very well. 
Trachea it has those tracheal rings around it, remember, that keep it open. And uh, trachea splits down here. This thing is called the carina, right here, where the, uh, where the intersection takes place between the right and the left lung. Now, everybody put your hand on your larynx for just a second and swallow. What happened to your larynx? It went up. Okay, the way that works, and we have great models to illustrate this as well, is that when you swallow, your uh, larynx goes up and it runs into this thing that's up here. It's called the epiglottis. The epiglottis is made of what kind of cartilage? Not hyaline, elastic cartilage. What's the other thing in your body that's made of elastic cartilage? Your ear. Very good. So you remember a little bit of it. Okay. This is a respiratory epithelium. This is what it looks like. Uh, you remember the name of this from chapter four when we were studying tissues the first time around in 231? What do you call that? Pseudostratified columnar epithelium. PCCE, remember that? Okay, so it's got cilia on the inside. Pseudostratified means what? Is it really stratified? No. no. It's really just one cell layer thick, um, but it doesn't look like that when you look at it under the microscope. Okay? All right. The whole idea of this, first of all, it's also got a whole lot of mucus glands in it. We call those goblet cells. Remember that? And those goblet cells secrete mucus so that stuff sticks to them so that all that dust that you tried to breathe in gets caught before it gets all the way down into your lungs. These cilia are in constant action. They are always working things up. In other words, anything that you breathe in, you really don't want it going all the way down into your alveoli. You want to get rid of it. And so those, those cilia are constantly working things up, and we have a special name for that, which we call the mucus escalator. And so that is constantly pushing things up to get them out of your lungs. Well, the problem is, I'm hoping there's no smokers in the crowd, but every time you smoke, you take a puff of cigarette smoke, it paralyzes all of those cilia for 12 hours. So for 12 hours, nothing gets pushed up. Your cilia just sit there dead to the world under the influence of that toxic smoke. Now, you think, well, that's no big deal. My grandpa, he lived to be 75. Well, he may have lived to be 75, but I can tell you what, his lungs weren't working right after 50 years of smoking. Because every time you're not pushing stuff up, stuff is accumulating down in your lungs. It's killing off alveoli. It's causing scarring and more mucus secretion by the bronchi. That is called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and it's also called emphysema. And while only maybe one out of 10 patients may get lung cancer from smoking, 99 out of 100 will get COPD and emphysema. talk about that. Um, you did the right thing. Whenever you smoke, it's whenever you stop smoking, it's a good thing. And from that point forward, the rest of your life, you follow the same curve as people who don't smoke. So, yeah. I'll, I'll show you a graph on that later in this talk. So here's an example of the PCCE. You notice that the, uh, the nuclei don't all line up. There's some down here. There's some up there. There's lots of goblet cells. These are just mucus cells, which you see over here. There's cilia on the top. And you notice that our the inner lining of our respiratory tree, our trachea on down, uh, is always lined with mucus. Just a thin little layer that would catch any dust or stuff that you 
tried that got in that bar. Here's the little mucus elevator over here. The cilia are constantly pushing it up. You try to get it up so you can kind of snort it up and swallow it or spit it out. So what is the respiratory defense system? What do we do to help us fight these problems? Well, we have a series of filtration mechanisms, which we kind of talked about a little bit already. Uh, these are the things that are involved. We have the mucus cells that are making mucus that are keeping the inner lining <coughs> mucusy, so they pick up anything in the air. Uh, the cilia uh, are constantly trapping uh, or sweeping the debris up towards the pharynx where you can then swallow it or spit it. Uh, that's called the mucus escalator, like I mentioned. Um, filtration in your nasal cavity, you've got hairs in your nose. And if you, once again, on a dirty, dusty day, if you've been outside, you probably can wipe your nose or blow your nose a little bit, and it's really dirty, grimy stuff. Well, that's, that's all stuff that your nose hairs have prevented from going down into your lung, which is a pretty good deal. Now we do get, some things get all the way down. Um, some pieces, small pieces of dust and so forth, get all the way down into our alveoli. And luckily for us, we have these cells called alveolar macrophages that do just what all macrophages do. What do macrophages do? They eat stuff, right? And so these macrophages eat dust particles or stuff that's made it down in the lung and get rid of them. Got it? The nose. Air enters the respiratory system through the nostrils. And by the way, it is always better to breathe through your nose. It's always better to breathe through your nose because it gets humidified, it gets warmed, or it gets cooled if it's really super hot air, so that it doesn't do any damage to the, to the structures below that. So your nose is really important, and the more you can breathe through your nose, it's always the better. Um, Nasal hairs live in the nasal vestibule. Um, this is the nasal vestibule right here. And uh, one thing, anybody ever put an NG tube in anybody? A nasogastric tube, pump somebody's stomach out? Well, the inclination is the first time you do that, you're going to say, oh, let me push this thing up here into your, into your nose. Well, your nose doesn't go that way. It goes that way. And so what you end up doing is pushing it straight back, just kind of right there and then straight back to get it down. Uh, nasal vestibule is pretty useless other than just gives you something to pick at, a uh, place to store some mucus so you can pick it, right? That's the first particle filtration system. Nasal septum. What's the nasal septum do? It divides the two halves of the nose, right? It also is covered with a mucous membrane. It also warms the air and moisturizes the air as you breathe it in. Um, there's also some sinuses up there. What are the sinuses? You know the names of them? Frontal, ethmoid, maxillary. Is that about it? I think so. What? Sphenoid, yeah, there is a sphenoid sinus. There's four of them, yeah. So anyway, what do the sinuses do for you besides make mucus and help you pick up crud that's kind of floating through in the air? Give you headaches. They what? Give you headaches. Well, if they get clogged up, they do give you headaches. They build up pressure and they give you headaches. Uh, help you talk. That's right. If you don't have sinuses, well, here's an example. Strum a guitar. It's got one of those big reverberating chambers on it here, and you strum it, it makes a nice, loud, beautiful sound. You take an electric guitar, it doesn't have any of those things, it just has a microphone down there, and you don't have any power on the microphone, and you strum it, it's like, it's just real tinny, and it doesn't make much noise, and so forth. Well, that's what our sinuses do for us. If I didn't have sinuses, and all my sinuses were clogged up today, I would sound like this, and I would talk like this, and that's about the best I could do. I couldn't be very loud, and you probably wouldn't understand me as well. Breathing 
through our nose and having the sinuses is really important for how we talk and reverberate the sounds around so they sound better. Okay? And then tears. Oh, tears. Tears are so good. You women have got it on us so good. Start crying. Next thing you know. <laughs> Why are those tears ending up in your nose, Ruby? Where do they drain? How do they get from your uh -uh, from your eyes to your nose? Um, yeah, the duct here, the corner of your eye. The little eye. duct in the corner of your eye goes down, and what do you call it? Duct that goes down. Nasal lacrimal duct, right? Okay. Um. So that's good. That also washes stuff out. Plus it gets you great sympathy. The superior portion of the nasal cavity is the olfactory region. Remember when we studied the olfactory system? The only place that there's olfactory uh, nerves is up above the upper tongue <coughs> in the very top of your nose. Okay? So that gives you smell. Um, Superior, middle, inferior meatuses, they're basically constricted air passages that cause air turbulence. And by creating that turbulence back in there, it warms the air and humidifies the air and traps particles. And those are all good things. You really don't want that stuff down in your lungs. The palate, the hard palate, everybody put your finger in your mouth. Front part is hard, right? Bone. I keep walking back. The whack farther, farther, farther. It gets soft back there, right? Because there's no more bone. It's just muscle back there. The soft palate, which is in the back part. Uh, what does the palate really do? It separates your nose from your mouth. Okay. Um, if you want to see a perfect example of that not working, uh, talk sometime patient who has a cleft lip or a, a more severe case is a cleft palate where there's a, a, a hole, the palate never came together all the way and they have a big opening between their mouth and their nose and they talk really funny um, and luckily it can be fixed pretty easily today but there are parts of the world where it cannot be fixed. There are no surgeons, plastic surgeons to fix that sort of thing and I remember one time when I was doing surgery in Haiti, we had a guy come in who was like 49 years old, and he had a, a cleft palate. Not only was he skinny, because he couldn't eat very well, because he couldn't chew well. And babies who have cleft palates need to have surgery immediately, because they usually can't suck. They can't suck on a nipple or on a, on a bottle or a, a nipple. And they oftentimes lose weight, lose weight, lose weight, and in fun bad parts of the world where there isn't adequate third level health care, uh, those babies die from a cleft palate. So it's so simple to fix in this country. Anyway, um, so that's the soft palate, and I'll just leave it at that. Air goes in through the internal nares. The internal nares is the inner opening, uh, is the, the backside opening out of the uh, nasal cavity and into the pharynx nasopharynx back there, um, and um, breathing through the mouth bypasses this important step, so try not to breathe too much through your mouth. Um, let's talk about the cartilages of the nose. You've had your friends say, oh yeah, I'm such a tough guy, I got in a big fight the other day, and I got my nose busted, and the nose was off to the side of my face, and my nasal bones were all broken, and the doctor just kind of pushed them back on, and I didn't even take any pain medicine. Well, first of all, tell them they're a liar because they're wrong. Uh, they didn't break any bones, more than likely. They just got their cartilages moved around a little bit. And usually with, with busted noses, what we think of as a busted nose, it's really not, not there's no bone broken. It's just the cartilages in there that got moved around. So usually you just kind of take them and give them a little okay anesthesia. Okay anesthesia is where you just say, it's okay, it's okay. 
push it back and get it straight and tape it and hold it in place and they, they generally do okay. Um, this is a nice, uh, what, what view, what section is this? A frontal section. What's the other name for a frontal section in the head? Coronal section. Very good. So this is a nice coronal section down through the face like you see on this guy over here. And you notice, here's your, uh, um, division down the nasal, this is your nasal septum. Notice part of it's caused from the ethmoid bone, part of it's caused by the vomer. Here's the hard palate. Here's the tongue down here. Here's the mouth. Uh, here's a maxillary sinus. Um, these are two eyeballs here and here. These are frontal sinuses up here in front. And uh, here's an ethmoid air cell. We, the ethmoid sinuses are not, it's not really a big single sinus. It's usually just a bunch of little bubbles of sinuses back there. Um, here's something else you ought to know. When you look into somebody's mouth, uh, you're going to see several things back in there. If you look into their nose, you're probably going to see these three um, conchi. Uh, if you can go all the way back there, and I have some bronchoscopy uh, pictures to show you a little later, um, that go back in through here, and you can see the opening back in there, which is the opening to that little tube. What do we call that tube? Well, it's called the auditory tube up there, but what's its real name? Eustachian tube, right? It's the one that goes to your ears. It's the one that gets clogged up in little kids and why they get repeated ear infections all the time. Well, that opens back there into the nasopharynx. Notice that the palate uh, pharyngeal tonsil is back there. We also call the pharyngeal tonsil the adenoids. And uh, my little granddaughter, Josie, I, you know, she had had a number of episodes of what we thought was um, tonsillitis. Uh, we took her out to the doctor, and he took one of these tiny little tubes that has a camera and a light on the end of it, and looked back in there, and he says, oh, yeah, she's, she's really had lots of troubles. And I tell you what, tonsillectomy may, may not seem like a big deal, but it totally changed that girl's life. Um, she snored all the time, big time snoring for a 10-year-old kid. Um, she was const constantly having tonsillitis and on antibiotics and off and on and off, feeling crummy the whole time. And uh, so she got her tonsils, her palatine tonsils, which you can see in the back of your throat, if you look into somebody's throat. And then the adenoids, they reach up here, kind of push that, the end of the soft palate out of the way and go through there and grab that one there and take it out. They generally don't take out these lingual tonsils because they don't seem to get infected very much. And I don't think anybody really wants to operate on somebody's tongue um, because it bleeds so much. It's just not a fun thing to do. And, I, and these don't really uh, give people that much trouble. So a tonsillectomy, when you see it on the surgery scale, ske schedule, it'll be listed as a TNA. TNA means tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy. So that means they're taking out the palatine tonsil and the pharyngeal tonsil up there called the adenoid. All right, so there's the tongue. Um, um, here's the hyoid bone right here. All these muscles are attached to the hyoid bone. Here's your epiglottis. And the way the epiglottis works is when you swallow, your, uh, your voice box here just kind of moves up, as you can feel it, right? Feel it moving up. It just moves up against the epiglottis and causes it to block off. And that way, when you swallow food, it won't go down the wrong pipe down into your breathing tubes, it'll go down through your esophagus into your stomach, which is where you want it to go. Now, I just want you to know that when, when you take A and P with me, when you see a nice picture like that, reflect on that for just a moment. Okay, here's a little reflection for you. What's this bone right there? What's that called? That sticky uppy one back there. Sticks up. Huh? Atlas and the axis, right. That's the axis, number two, and the atlas spits over it, rolls around like that. 
So whenever you see a, a cervical spine film that shows one bone going up that much, you know that is the axis. And you also know, what about this one here? That's part of the axis, number one. So that's C1, C2, C3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Oh, what's this, what's this little thing out here in front? Thyroid gland. Yeah. And the big cartilage, the big cartilage that you're feeling when you feel your Adam's apple is called the thyroid cartilage. And the cartilage that's right below it, which feels kind of small, is called the cricoid cartilage. Remember, though, that the thyroid is big in front and little in back. Cricoid is little in front. Did I say that wrong? And big in back. Thyroid's big in front, little in back. Cricoid's little in front, big in back. We have wonderful models of the larynx that you'll need to study on, and those, those comments will become very obvious. Anything else out of that one? Oh yeah, what do we call this right here? What? what? Sagittal. Yeah. All right, the pharynx is this chamber back there that's shared by both the digestive and the respiratory system. It goes from basically the internal nares, which is the top of the nasopharynx, down to the entrances of the larynx and the esophagus, where the tube really splits into the trachea in front and the esophagus in back. Uh, it's divided into the nasopharynx, the top part, the oropharynx, which basically connects to the mouth, and the laryngopharynx, which is the bottom portion uh, around the larynx. I think I've said enough. You need to know that the nasopharynx has the tonsils, the adenoids up there, and it also has those openings to the right and left auditory tubes in it. The oral pharynx is the one you look at when you look at the back of someone's throat. The laryngopharynx is below that. It goes from the hyoid bone basically down to the level of the larynx. I don't know how important that is. But anyway. So, the glottis. What is the glottis? Hmm? The glottis is nothing. The glottis is nothing but an opening. Okay? So there's no solid structure you can put your point your finger at and say, oh yeah, that's the glottis. The glottis is the opening that goes through the larynx that is what you breathe through. Okay? Now, the larynx is this voice box, this cartilaginous structure that goes around the glottis to help keep it open. Um, and uh, I'll say <laughs> you need to know three cartilages, really four. The thyroid cartilage is the big one in front, one on top. One below that is the cricoid cartilage, little in front, big in back. And then the epiglottis, which is that weird one that's way up on top that is made of the other kind of cartilage called the last cartilage. Yes, ma'am? Sort of the, it's sort of the last part of the, of the soft palate. Uh, apparently, uh, it's a really good question, Dan. I'm going to answer it. I would tell you that I think really what it's for is to keep you from putting milk up in your nose. It kind of closes off the opening between your oropharynx and your nasal, up in your nose. Now, my funny story on that is I was sitting there in the operating room and there was this old guy, he was a surgeon out in Dallas, but God, he was old. He was able to still practice. And I walked into his room and said, hey, uh, Dr. Hyde, what you doing? He said, oh, I'm taking out the tonsils here. And he's looking back through in the back of the mouth, and I can kind of look over his shoulder, and I can see that the uvula was in his way. And he couldn't seem to get it retracted one way or the other so he could see what he's doing. And he says, scissors, please. Tweezers. Grab the uvula and he just cut it off. <laughs> he said, Now I can see. 
So, you know, I don't know if that patient suffered too badly from that or not, to be honest with you. Uh, what? No, you can't. You've got to put things back No, you don't. You, that's, a, that's a one rule in surgery. You get to take, you get to take stuff out. But anyway. I, I, I couldn't believe it. I, I never did tonsillectomy, so I don't know. It was the craziest thing I ever saw. But yeah, he just said, here, now I can see. <laughs> Thyroid cartilage is the Adam's apple. It's made of hyaline cartilage and forms the anterior and lateral walls of the larynx. There's ligaments attached to all of these things back there. I do not expect you to know the names of all of them, although there's a few that you should, like the cricothyroid membrane, which connects the cricoid to the thyroid bone. That's not too tough and so forth. We'll talk about those as we go on. The cricoid is below that. It's also hyaline cartilage. It forms most of the back of the larynx. It's really big in back, but small in front, like I said. Um, the ligaments attach to the, it, it attaches to the first tracheal cartilage, and it also articulates, this is the last set of cartilages that I want you to be aware of, called the arytenoid cartilages. The arytenoid cartilages are important because they have uh, uh, fibers that attach to the vocal cord. And the arytenoid cartilages back in there kind of twist. And as they twist, they kind of tighten up your vocal cords. As you tighten up your vocal cords, you go higher. And as you relax them, you go lower. And it also moves them closer together. The closer they are together, the higher pitch, the farther apart lower the pitch. And like I said, I've got some, uh, I've got some videos to show you. Um, so that's what the arytenoid cartilages are. They're the ones that really control your voice. The rotation of the arytenoid cartilages back in there. Epiglottis, we talked about, it uh, attaches to your thyroid cartilage and your hyoid bone up, up top. Um, enough, I think we've said enough about it. Probably said enough about all of this. Um, just know that when you swallow, I think this is a really important point, that when you swallow, your larynx goes up, okay? You notice that when you swallowed and had your fingers on it. That, that allows the epiglottis to kind of slap back over the glottis so that when you swallow, nothing goes down the wrong way. That's really its function. <clears throat> As you can see here, it prevents entry of food and liquids into the respiratory tract. There's a couple others. Um, I don't really ask you to learn these, the corniculate and the cuneiform, so just forget about them. Here's a nice picture of all of these cartilages. Uh, I told you that the, the thyroid cartilage is the one that's big in front. And notice here, this is the cricoid cartilage below it, and you notice that it's big in back. Okay? So, thyroid big in front, cricoid little in front. And then you get into the tracheal cartilages, the rings around the trachea. Uh, way up here above, you've got the epiglottis, and the, here's the hyoid bone up there as well. If you look at these from the back, uh, and, and, and you have the back wall of most of the larynx is taken off in this picture, you can see the vocal ligaments right here, seen inside there. And just outside of that, you have these other folds, which we call the false vocal cords, um, not really also called the vestibular <laughs> ligaments. Uh, false vocal cords, they're, they're designed to close off if you get food back there. Um, if you get irritated, the vestibular ligaments will close, and you couldn't talk if you wanted to because nothing can go through. That's just a protective mechanism that we have to keep things from going down um, into our uh, windpipe. Um, here's those two. Here's the vestibular ligament. This is the false vocal cords. These have nothing to do with talking. Uh, they just are a protective fold. Um, here's the vocal ligaments. These are the ones that really do uh, the vibrating when you talk. Um, thyroid cartilage below that, cricoid cartilage between the two, cricothyroid ligament. Ambulance guys in the room. I never have either. I've done a few tracheostomies, but I never did a cricothyroidotomy. Basically,
basically the New Deal, uh, which was invented really just about 20 years ago, and this usually happens in the person who somebody's been trying to do a, bell, uh, a Heimlich on, they've got food caught in their throat, and they can't breathe. Believe me, don't ever do a Heimlich if the patient is talking. If they can talk, they've got an airway, right? And they've got air moving back and forth. But if, you, if they're talking, if they can't talk and they've got a piece of meat in their throat, you know, try the, the Heimlich maneuver. Um, but then, if that still fails, um, you go in here and uh, right along in here, you make a, just a little incision right there, just below the thyroid. Thyroid problem is the big one. The next one, just make a knife cut. You can do it with a ballpoint pen if necessary in a real emergency to get an airway open so that the patient, this is all clogged up up here so they can breathe through here and it saves their life. Um, you'll see it on all the ambulance shows and all the hospital shows. I'm doing it from once in, once in a while. Um, yeah. sometimes because you don't know their level of training and you don't know what equipment they have with them right there at the moment. Yeah. That's not something you can do. Oh, no. No. Very, very <laughs> slow. Uh, another thing I would tell you just from a first aid point of view, most people who get meat stuck in their throat, what they do is they're sitting at the table, they're eating with their friends, they're having a steak, they're having a bottle of wine, and they suddenly just kind of get up and leave the table and kind of go, go back to the bathroom and they're found dead on the floor of the bathroom. And the reason is, is because they're embarrassed that they choked on meat. They probably didn't cut it up small enough and they had a big chunk in their mouth. And so if you're ever at a table in a meal like that and somebody gets up suddenly and leaves the table, follow them. Follow them to the bathroom and make sure they are breathing. Because they may just hold their breath all the way in there, close the door, and they, they thought there's just something they could, oh, they could just cough it up if they could just get out of this social situation and get back there where it's nice and quiet, but they can't. And they're oftentimes found dead in the bathroom. Well, there's a lot, huh? And that's why ladies go to the bathroom first. <laughs> <laughs> ladies always do never go alone. Good. There you go. All right, I think we've covered all of this stuff here. Remember that the tracheal cartilages don't go all the way around. Remember that from your microscope pictures? Uh, we'll, we'll, do, we'll cover that again. Um, I think I've said these things. Um, sound production is caused by vibrating of the vocal cords, uh, which makes the noises. Uh, there's a whole lot more, however, to making speech than just your vocal cords, than your vocal cords. What does it take to make a S? It takes a tongue, it takes lips, you know, it, it takes a hard palate, it takes all those other parts back there to make what we call articulation, really speech. Phonation is just, oh, you know, it's just noise. But articulation is really what makes speech. And that's why speech therapy is such an important uh, field um, that professionals can really help people that have troubles with this. A lot of times it's caused by tumors, having had surgery or having had an injury that's damaged things back there. Sometimes it comes from up here in your brain. Um, but speech therapy is a really, uh, really cool um, a field. Here's a nice view, uh, looking down. This is the front. You know it's the front because there's the epiglottis in the 
front. Here's the vocal cords. The, and the glottis is that open little slit that's open there between that. That's the glottis. Remember, the glottis is nothing, just an opening. Here's the vestibular folds. The false vocal cords are up here above that. Here's a corniculate cartilage. These guys back here, I believe, are the arytenoid cartilages, the ones that really vi uh, rotate and vibrate, uh, that rotate in order to control the vocal cords. This is the bottom of the tongue. What else is there we haven't looked at? Um, I'm going to show you uh, bronchoscopy pictures of looking down somebody's throat while they're trying to talk, and you can see these uh, um, tracheal rings down through there. Keep that in mind. That's what you're going to be seeing here in just a minute. Uh, laryngeal muscles. Uh, there's lots of muscles that are involved here. Please do not, you do not need to know the names of all these muscles. Um, they're just zillions of them, obviously, to control something as delicate and as uh, amazing as a vocal box, you know, to make noises. Uh, so there's Muscles that, that work in your neck and pharynx and they're big ones. Uh, there's intrinsic muscles. You know, intrinsic means muscles inside the structure itself. So these would be muscles that are inside the larynx that control the vocal folds and open and close the glottis in order to allow us to make noise. Trachea is called the windpipe. Uh, uh, it goes uh, from about here at the lower end of the larynx down to where the trachea divides into the two main stem bronchi. Um, branches into the right and left pulmonary bronchi. We always call them main stem bronchi, I don't know. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Well, let's see if this one will work for me. Okay, um, so this is, a, this is a microscopic slide of the trachea. Y'all need to look at these. We have plenty of them in the box back there. Um, the, the, the rings of the, of the trachea are a big C. Usually they come around to about there. Looks like they've, there's a piece missing here, or maybe they just uh, got the one right below it. Uh, it wasn't quite on a perfect straight cut. But anyway, the respiratory epithelium, remember, is PCCE, right? And here's the tracheal cartilage, which is what kind of cartilage? Hyalin, right? And this area across here is a big bunch of fibers and elastic tissue, a little muscle called the trachealis muscle. Now, what's the function of the fact that why don't the rings just go all the way around? Yeah. The reason is, is because we like our steak. We like to take a big bite of steak. And when we do, and that big bite of steak wants to make its way down the esophagus back here, you want it to be able to push out here into your windpipe and have room for it to get on down. Okay? Yeah, they can. Eggplant. They can choke on eggplant, but what fun would that be? No, I eat steak. I like steak. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the other thing I want you to look at on this picture, because you guys are getting pretty smart now with this A and P stuff, right? There's a whole lot of questions I could ask off of that one picture right there. For example, that's an artery. You guys should know what arteries look like, right? They've got that internal elastic membrane. Remember that little zig, that little squiggle thing? Yeah. And I, uh, these, what are these things here? Those are big veins. That's right. You see, they're never right, nice and round like the arteries are. And sometimes they're multiple. And, oh, I wish this label wasn't here. But you notice this big junk 
pile of junk around the front there? That's the thyroid gland, okay? The thyroid gland is right there as well. So if you take a slice across through there, you're going to get all of that stuff. And, and don't ignore it. Think about it. When you, get, when you grab a slide back there, even though it may say trachea on it, it, it's time in your education that you should be able to look around and see all the other things and figure them out. You might see some lymph nodes. That's probably a little lymph node right there. Uh, the esophagus has several layers. It's got uh, mucosa. It's got some muscularis mucosa. It's got some uh, <coughs> external mu um, muscularis back there. I know we haven't gotten to digest it, but it's coming next after this I was chapter. Ask, inside the veins, so the the Christi ampullarises. I think Christi ampullarises are just found in your ear. Yeah. You got about 15 or 20 of them. Uh, they're discontinuous on the back and have the trachealis muscle with them. Uh, this is an important point. Um, the two different bronchi of the lungs, the right and the left primary bronchus. Um, I think to illustrate that to you, I'll just reach over here and uh, maybe you could flip a light on at least one of them. Here's a Here's a, from the front up here, there's the front, you notice in the back here, you've got, uh, you know, you got the tracheal's muscle running down here, and uh, so this is the right, right side, so it goes like this. Now, when you look at that, do you see any difference between this one and that one? It may not seem that obvious to you, but the point that you should always notice is that the right main stem bronchus is more of a direct shot straight down, whereas the left kind of angles out. And it's harder for stuff to get into your left main stem bronchus than it is in your right. So if your kid chokes on a peanut, it's probably going to go down his right main stem bronchus and block it off right there. You'd like to think it doesn't get stuck up here where he can't breathe at all, but if it goes on down there, it's only going to block Brock off the right side. Now, the significance of that is that uh, if you work in an emergency room, you will have a lot of um, intoxicated or sick old people come in. And when sick old people come in, and you figure out they have pneumonia, it's almost always in the right lower lobe. And the reason is because that's where they aspirate. They try to swallow something, they're chewing on something, they drink a, a glass of wine, and they don't, they're talking and it goes down the wrong pipe. It almost will always go to the right lower lobe. Yeah. Yeah, right lower lobe is where almost all what we call aspiration pneumonia occurs because when they aspirate, I mean, obviously, assuming they're not laying on their left side, if they're laying on their left side, then it might go more to the left. But usually, most people are upright and it goes down the right side. It's all explained by matter, right? So, the right primary bronchus is bigger than the left and it descends at a steeper angle. And that's why more stuff goes to the right. I think I'll stop right there. Um, and we'll move on from there on Wednesday. On Wednesday, we will have lecture over in, in 106. Lovely room. Did anybody come a little bit early? Was the other class still in there? They were still in there. Yeah, they're in there till like late. They were yeah. late. <laughs> what do we need to start doing? Like beating on the wall or? Okay, thank you. If you have any problems, call me. I have a question. Okay. Um, I do questions. I wasn't listening as fast as you were talking here. The internal nares enter from the larynx, the esophagus, is from yeah. the where to the where? See, here, here's the internal nares right mm -hmm. there. And so what part is that? Like, But you said the internal nares is what? It's, it's a, kind of the division between the nasal cavity and the nasopharynx. The nasopharynx. That's what I thought. Yeah. That's what I thought. Thank you, Al. Yeah.
I might have your signature so I can talk to you. You what now? I might have your signature over here so yes. I can talk to you. Yeah, now, now you, you just need to understand the problem I'm in is because the fire marshal says 28 is the most we can have in this room. Yes. And we've got 28. You're number 29. Someone will drop. Well, that's what will almost always happen. Because we are in uh, the same group and same yep. direct get ready, yep. but I was kicked out because I have a home. And then when I come, come to see him, when I come to see him, they say, uh, we should know what your major is and which school you're going to, what your major is. There you go. This is my husband's x-ray, you see all that yeah. lamp oil, and then a week later, it's already getting better. He had pneumonia yeah. for about three weeks, like really bad, and it took about six months for him to feel...